That's another 25 or 22 pages, something like that. So be sure, if you've got a manual, be sure to get the last half. All right? We don't want you to have the first six principles and not have the other. So if you don't get it tonight, we give it to you tomorrow, but just make sure you get it. So point B, starting at the top of the page, it says, the enemy's use of the principle of, uh, of the objective. The enemy uses this principle also. Matter of fact, most of these principles, to be very honest with you, the enemy uses better than Christians do. See, the problem with Christians is we are so divided, not just among members of the same church and of different churches, but we're divided against ourselves. And the Bible even talks about people who oppose themselves. And that's what happens most of the time in the church is people who oppose themselves or they refuse or, or reject their own deliverance, Hebrews 11 says, whenever deliverance is provided and yet we, we reject it. Now, what the people in Hebrews 11, what they did, they rejected deliverance from a situation. What we do, we reject deliverance from our problems or from uh, situations in our lives, but it's a little bit different. They were martyred and instead God wants to bring us out of sin or out of sickness and we fight him as he tries to deliver us. And so one of the things we have to do if you can't get in unity with anybody else, at least get in unity with yourself. All right? I know that, that may sound strange, but I'm telling you, if you gotta, there's got to be some unity there somewhere. All right? Now, here, the enemy's use of the principle of, a, of objective and individual combat. And you know that that's what we're breaking this down to is both individual and corporate. So, as I said in the beginning, what we're trying to do is cover the full range. And there's a lot of details that I can't get into just because... Time constraints won't let us. You know, I'm talking about individual situations, things like that. But I'll tell you this. Honestly, if I was to give you a lot of individual situations, you would take those as law. But if I can give you the principles and I explain the principles and give you just a couple of, of maybe examples of how they're used, then you can take the principles, go study them, and you will have a more pure view of looking at your situation and find out what situation fits or which principle fits in your situation. If I was to give you a whole bunch of little details, you would be totally confused. Was that cover this? No, wait, that's kind of like this principle over here. And how does that cover? And the more details I give you, the more confused you might possibly get. And so, which if you go to church much, you know that happens. So uh, what I'm trying to do is give you the basic principles with a definition so that it gives you a, a broad view so that it's, you're quicker to recognize. How many of you know that if you work in computers, the more information you have to search for, the longer it takes, right? What I'm trying to give you <clears throat> is a simple guide so that you can spot the problem, the attack, very quickly, and you'll know how to deal with it. So I don't want you analyzing too much to the point where you get paralyzed in analysis. You know, analysis by, or paralysis by analysis. We don't want that. So... Let's read it. First off, it says, The enemy is very effective in his use of the principle of the objective. He has had eons to perfect his craft. He has the skill of a master chess player. <clears throat> his current move is seldom his reason for moving. See, that's one thing the church doesn't get. We see what the enemy does. We see one little move and we think, Oh, that's what he's after. And very seldom is that what he's after. Usually he's after something three or four moves down the road and we don't even see where he's heading. We just see what he's doing right now. And by the time he, we actually see what's going on, he's already ad obtained his objective. So always remember that usually the move you see is not what he's heading for. Right? <clears throat> so you have to learn how to... You have to learn to be able to predict based on his character and nature what he's going after. Okay, <clears throat> if you see sickness or disease start to come into a family to any degree, no matter who it comes in through, it'll try to end up on a child. It'll try to. Why? And what I see, even the doctors say, well, that's because they're younger and their immune system is weaker. And all I said, but I got news for you. Children's immune systems, children as a whole are highly adaptive. Their immune system is, is very strong. Right? Especially if you compare your immune system to theirs and your length of life to their length of life, theirs is multiple times stronger by uh, comparison than yours is. And children, you can see <clears throat> if you were to lose a limb, 
it would be, especially at, a, at an advanced age or a middle age or whatever you want to call it, then it could be extremely devastating to you and you may never truly adapt to it. But a child can lose a limb and by the, by the time they're, if they lose it early on, by the time they are early teens, they can run, say if it's a leg, they can run as fast as children that have two good legs. And so we've, we've actually seen some programs where they were dealing with some of this stuff and I've recorded some things uh, with St. Jude's Hospital and, and different programs. As a matter of fact, I just saw today on CNN that there's a young girl, uh, maybe, possibly maybe you've seen some of this, a uh, young girl from Haiti, 16 years old. Uh, actually, she was 15 at that point, but she had a 16 pound tumor. She was uh, operated on, they took this thing off, and I have that on video. And I recorded it whenever it came on television. And I mean, I've seen a lot, all right? I mean, honestly, I didn't think there was anything I haven't seen. But this shocked me. And I couldn't help but just sit there and cry the first time I watched it especially. Just to, to look and see, you know, sometimes you're just brought back to reality and you realize just how bad the devil is. And <clears throat> shortly after that, my wife was going through some of our photographs. We had a bunch on, you know, just real, <laughs> I know it's not common anymore, but real photographs. And <clears throat> she was scanning them in and putting them on the computer and saving them because, you know, they get tore up over time. And she found some of our first daughter. And I told her, I said, you know, the pain of losing her is, is gone. We lost her in 81. It's been many years. So the actual pain of losing her is gone. But still, it's good sometimes to look at that picture because she had a hemangioma tumor as big as my fist, as many of you know, that were outside of her, her, her mouth. And it was very horrible to look at. And at that time, I'd never seen anything near it anyway. And so... Sometimes you just, it's good to be reminded of what kind of spurred you into the fight. And you realize, and, and, and then you, you can show that to people when you say, this is why I hate sickness and disease so bad. See, most people don't hate it. That's the problem. They want to be rid of it, but they don't hate it. See, wanting to be rid of it means when you get rid of it, <clears throat> you go back to normal living. But when you hate it, when you get rid of it, you keep chasing it. And that's what the church doesn't get. They don't chase it. All they do is try to keep it off of their house. Okay? That's not true love. True love is getting it off of your house and then chasing it down the street before it gets on anybody else's house. Okay? Even if you have to lay down the rest of your life to chase the thing. So, <clears throat> you look at, uh, what's his name? Uh, John Walsh. You see? <clears throat> that man turned a tragedy into a mission. And, and you know, God forbid that the tragedy had even happened from the beginning. It was awful, and it, you know, I hate that it did happen. <clears throat> but look at what the tragedy has now produced because he chose not to sit and wallow in the, in the pain of it, and he chose to become proactive and chase that thing, that, that type of situation. And he, look what all he's done. Look, look at what he has built out of that. And so uh, sometimes, you just, <clears throat> sometimes you just need to get fired up over something. You know, that's one of the problems in the church is that people just don't get fired up. They just don't, <clears throat> they just die slow. You know, a lot of people are just like frogs in water and the water keeps getting hotter and they just, they just keep sitting there. Whenever, sometimes you just, you need something to come along and just get you kicking and get you out of the water. Amen? Yeah. So, all right, let's get into this. I'm trying not to get off on too many bunny trails here. <clears throat> so, the current, his current move is seldom his reason for moving. While most Christians plan for next week, he's planning for the next generation. He's not so concerned about you as much as he is trying to stop anything that you might learn or anything that you might do, and he sure doesn't want you passing it down to your next generation because he don't want to have to face another one of you later on. And so he tries to stop you as quick as he can. Now, most of his moves are... Now, now listen carefully because a lot of stuff I have to kind of read slowly to get piece by piece. Most of the enemy's moves, now when I say enemy, I'm going to be using the word enemy a whole lot, more so than I am devil or Satan or any of that kind of stuff. But just know when I'm using the word enemy, I'm talking about anything that falls under Satan and under his category and anything under his dominion. Sick, sin, sickness, disease, any of that, it's all an enemy, okay? <clears throat> so most of the enemy's moves are to move you away from his true objective. Now, think about this. The objective in World War II for the Normandy invasion was to land an enormous amount of troops in a short period of time 
into one place, one area of ground, area of beaches, so that the Allies could get a strong foothold and invade Fortress Europe and start to put a stop. And that was supposed to be the beginning of the end for Hitler's Third Reich. And to do that, now see, Hitler and all the, the German officers, the Nazi officers, knew that it was coming. Everybody knew it. They just weren't sure where. They, they didn't think it was going to be as far south as it was. They thought it was going to be further up in Calais. And so they kept their troops kind of widespread. And as they started seeing more movement, they, of course, the Allies sent Patton up along the, the uh, English coast, which made all the Nazis move all their forces up, and it further weakened the south. Now, that is a prime example of the principle of objective. What the Allies were doing is their move was not to attack. The moving they were doing was to move their enemy away from the place of intended attack, right? That's what the enemy does. He will try to draw your attention in one area so that while your attention is over here, he'll hit what, he, what he's really aiming for. And he'll try to hit one area that doesn't seem too bad, and, but yet what it will do is it will draw your resources. It'll draw your finances. It'll draw your time. It'll draw your attention and once that is weakened enough, see, if you had all those things together, he couldn't beat you. But if he can weaken you enough to where you can get these things, where he can get these, your, your attention, your resources, your finances weakened enough and spread out, then he can hit you on this other side, and he's strong enough to take you then because you're so spread out. So a lot of times what it appears he's attacking is not his true objective. Our problem sometimes now, and <clears throat> this is almost going to sound like a contradiction, but you kind of have to hear the whole thing first. Uh, you've heard me tell you before, if sickness or disease tries to jump on you, as soon as you feel different, as soon as you feel anything not normal, you don't wait. You don't go to the doctor. You know, you don't wait till after you go to the doctor to find out what it is so you can pray more effectively. You immediately attack that thing, no matter what it is, right? Well, don't I need a name or don't I? Nope. You attack. You command it to go. It doesn't matter what. You, you tell a burglar, most cops don't know the name of the burglar, right? They just tell them to come out with their hands up. They don't always call them by name, right? Some reason the church thinks you have, thinks you have to know every spirit by name before it'll come out. So you don't always have to know what it is. You just got to know that you have authority over it. And if you know that you have authority over all sickness and disease, then it really doesn't matter what name it is, right? right? So, <clears throat> now, as you realize what his objective is, you can learn to stay focused and you can learn that whenever he tries to draw you off, you can, sometimes what we do is react, we react too quickly rather than recognizing what it is and applying the right amount of force. We're going to look at that a little bit later on. It's called the, the principle of economy of force. See, you have to apply force, but you have to apply the right amount. Now, there is such a thing as shock and awe. We heard about that and where they just come in and just overwhelm. It was the same thing of the, what we call the Blitzkrieg in World War II. And <clears throat> that's where the term stormtroopers came from. And all this kind of stuff where they just come in and overwhelm. But what we have to realize is that sometimes the enemy will try to draw you off to weaken you. And we have to recognize what the feint is. Now, so far we've talked about uh, national warfare between two armies, right? And then we, now we're talking also, but now we're talking a little bit lower a uh, lower scale of individuals, right? Individual warfare would be along the lines of someone, say you're in there and you're fixing a fight and the guy wants to hit you in the stomach. Well, but for, he's not going to just go for your stomach because you would block. So what does he do first? He throws a feint toward the face. Why? Because if something comes towards your face, you close your eyes and then he can move lower. So he'd throw it high and then come in low, either with the same hand or an opposite hand. As he throws that in, usually one quickly follows the other because if it waits too long, it loses its impact. If he throws it quick, quick, then you won't have time to recognize it. But if he throws it slow and then comes across and makes it two separate attacks, you have time to readjust your attention and both attacks will be handled individually. He's lost the element of surprise, right? Now, you say, okay, how does this apply to spiritual warfare? The enemy will come in. You, that's what you have to watch for. He'll come in and hit you, usually on something that's not all that vital, but it's enough to draw your attention. And while you're looking at it, he'll hit you somewhere else. 
And that's why, remember last night? See, this goes right back to the principle of security. If your bases are covered, it doesn't matter what attacks he throws, right? You cover your bases. How are some of the ways that you cover your bases? First and foremost, live right. First and foremost, all right? That's the number one way to cover your bases. It's the number one way to protect yourself. There is protection in living holy. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that if you live holy that you can't be attacked. The, the uh, I guess I'd say that the qualifier here is this. You have to know that you can be protected. See, the Bible tells us that the shield of faith will quench every fiery dart. And yet, I, don't, I hardly ever meet a Christian who really believes that. Because almost all of them believe, yeah, but he got in this way, and I gave him ground, and I gave him this, and I, I opened the door, and all these different things. And I'm like, well, you know, do, are you a believer? Do you have faith? Well, yeah, I have faith. I believe God. Well, you, the shield of faith, what about that? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know. Well, do, do you believe that, that you can be protected from every fiery dart? Well, yeah, that's what the Bible says. Okay, well, then why don't you believe you're, you can be protected by this, against this thing? Well, it's because I opened the door. I opened, See, you start adding stuff in that God didn't say. But once you start to believe that even if you make a mistake, that you're still protected, it's amazing how protected you get. Why? Because the enemy can't lie to you. He can't deceive you anymore. And you start to walk protected. Now, let's look at this next part. <clears throat> he methodically works toward his objective, which is usually hidden from sight until it is within his reach. In other words, he will keep you distracted somewhere else until he's close enough to actually strike what he's aiming at. That's one of the reasons why your family, your, your possessions, I suppose, to some degree, should always be covered in a sense. Now, understand when I say covered with prayer, I don't mean every day you've got to get up and go, right, protect, protect this one, protect that one, protect my car, protect my house, protect my dog. I, I plead the blood over the house, the dog, the cat. I, I'm not saying you have to do that. I've heard that teaching, and I'll be honest with you, I don't do it. I, I expect every day for God to keep me. And I don't expect that to stop at 12.01 midnight. Right? I expect it to continue. Because, well, to be honest with you, I usually am awake at 12.01 midnight. But if I wasn't, I wouldn't want to have to wake up and set my clock and say it again, just keep him from attacking me before I woke up. You see? I believe, I expect him to protect me. He said he is faithful to keep that which is committed to him. So my job is to do my job. His job is to do his job, right? My job is to believe him. Isn't that it? Everything it comes down to, only believe. That's, that's what it all comes back to. His job is to do what he said he would do. He said he would keep me, he would protect me, that he would always be with me, he would never leave me. All that's his job, right? Now, I don't have to constantly remind him to do his job. It doesn't hurt to say it, but when you're saying it, you're really not reminding him as much as you're reminding yourself, yeah. right? And you're, you're enforcing it in you. You are building it into your, your spiritual DNA. And so it doesn't hurt a bit to say it, but what I'm saying is, here's, I'll give you one example. I was, um, years back, man, I was into that. You know, every morning, get up, plead the blood, in Jesus' name, I'm protected, I believe in God's protection all day long, that, I did it, you know? That was the teaching I had at the time. That's what I did. Whatever teaching I got, I did it. And so I was doing it faithfully. Then one morning, I got up, got busy real quick, didn't do it. And do you know that that afternoon, and just so happened, that was the same day that I got the information that, the, that John G. Lake's ministry had been passed to me. The same day. And so, matter of fact, I think that's what got me busy in the beginning was somebody called and I got ended up talking and all that. But about just before noon, I was downtown on the street, uh, in the, in, on a street in the town that I lived, and I had a car, and I was standing outside the car, had the door open, and was standing there. I was putting some stuff. Actually, I had the letter that had come to me, and I was putting some stuff in the car. I just put it in, and that's how you raise the dead. Now, <laughs> all right. Now, anyway, seriously, but I was getting into the car. <laughs> I will get letters, you watch. I will get letters on it. <laughs> Go back to the part where you raise the dead. No, <clears throat> but I was getting into the car, okay? And I'm standing there, and I put everything in the back seat, just fixing to get in the front seat, and all of a sudden, and my car door, remember the old uh, 74 Cordobas? Remember them? They had a door that would reach probably from here to that wall. Remember when you open them up? 
and they stuck out like wings. <laughs> and I had that door opened up, and I was standing there, and I was going to get in the car, and right then, I was facing inside the car, I felt it was like a hand on my back shove me, and I went into the car, literally laid across the seat, and as soon as I was put into the car, a car took my door off. I mean, completely took it off. I mean, it, well, not completely took it off, but what I mean is it, it pushed back so far that I had to drive home in the gutter because the door was open so wide that it would hit anything on the other side. <laughs> and I kept trying to shut it, and it wouldn't shut. <laughs> so, and then I think we took the door off and put a strap across it, kind of like the Dukes of Hazard, you know. So. <laughs> but now the amazing thing was, see, I was protected. I was not hurt. I wasn't injured to one degree. Now, my car was messed up. And then I started going back, and I started asking God, because I didn't have the money for a new door or anything. So I asked God, what, what happened here? What's the deal? You know, was my angel, you know, not paying attention, or what happened? What, and and he's, he, he's like, well, who do you think pushed you into the car? Because I know I felt a hand on my back. And so I started thinking, okay, then why my car? And then I went back, and God showed me that that day I had not been confessing the protection of God over it. Now, the mercy of God protected me. But the law that I had set up, that I believed that I had to invoke personal protection for all of my things, the fact that I put that into effect, that I believed that I had to do it every day, meant that I had to do it every day. And any day I didn't do it, I wasn't protected because that was the law that I set up. You get that? God didn't set it up. I set it up. So therefore, if you really want to get down to it, my salvation, my protection, was back on my works. Right? You see that? I expected, what I was doing is, I was working my own salvation, but not in the way the Bible talks about it. I was believing that I was protected as long as I believed I was protected. Now I have learned to believe I'm protected 24-7. And you know, I've, I've been in situations where I should have been severely injured, and I have never been injured, and it's just amazing how God protects me. I mean, all kinds of... Whenever I was up in, uh, what, Ohio, we started to leave one morning, and I, I met with the guys. They came down from Duluth, Minnesota. The, the, Y'all have met them here now. And so I was heading out that morning. The next morning, they were going to follow me back to Texas. And I'm driving down. I think that was a Sunday morning. Was that a Sunday morning? Wasn't it? Yeah. You know, everything it was dead in the town, slow, all that stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm just driving, you know, down the street, trying to find our way back to the highway. They're following me. And I look up. There's a red light. There's a cab stopped in the way. And so I hit the brakes. And, I mean, I had to swerve. But what the problem was, whenever I, as soon as I hit, everything slid forward because I had tapes and all that stuff with me. It slid under my brake pedal. And I couldn't brake. And so I had, all I could do is swerve. And, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I'm surprised I still have a mirror on my car because it was so close. Hadn't been in a situation like that in a long time. And we swerved over and there was a man on the street corner that was fixing to walk across and you ought to see him. He jumped back behind a pole and was hiding from me because he thought I was going to hit him. I actually thought I was going to too. And I went on through the red light. Thank God there wasn't another car coming. And then when I finally got stopped, the guy in the cab came up and see if, to see if I was all right. But the enemy is always looking for an opportunity. I'm going to show you. I don't know if we'll get there tonight or not. Matter of fact, I don't think we will. But um, I will show you that at one place it says that the devil left Jesus. And then the original Greek says, for a more opportune time. And so he watches you. And if he doesn't see a weakness, he'll leave. And he'll come back later whenever he... When, see, most of the time you feel like you're under attack, so you're on guard. So he knows if he leaves, or after a while, you'll lighten up. And you'll let your guard down. And he'll come back and find that more opportune time. That's why you can never be unguarded. You always have to keep your shield of faith up. You always have to. It's just like they're talking about the, the uh, homeland security thing. You know, <clears throat> We've got people trying to smuggle stuff in. And they've got how many thousands of opportunities. And all they've got to do is be right once. Right? And, but we have to be right every time. Right? Well, it's the same way. We have to be on guard. See, this is not... The, the Christian life was never meant to be some, you know, bed of roses. 
That's not the whole point. You're here as a soldier. You're here, to, you're here as guardian soldiers, liberators of planet Earth. Therefore, you are going to have to fight. You're going to have to be on guard. You're going to be diligent. And the more people that God gives you influence over or around, you're going to have to be even more vigilant because now you're watching out for them too. So, let's read on here because time is running. It says, <clears throat> for instance, he will set you up with an argument and then with some inconsiderate driver just before you're supposed to pray for someone in a wheelchair. That's the way he works. He'll try to set you up. Now, the argument, big deal. He didn't care about an argument. Now, what he wants is you to be ineffective. He could care less about the situation. And he, he used that on me for years. You know, I, you do something, you make an argument, or, or you mess up or something, and then somebody wants to be prayed for. And then all of a sudden, he's talking to you at the same time. You see, he is so... That's his whole gimmick right there. He'll try to set you up, and then if you fall for it, then he's telling you in your ear how bad you are for falling for it. So he's working on both ends. And what you have to realize is, and this is what, as I as studying the Bible, I had had teaching that if there was any strife, God couldn't work. And then I started reading the Bible, and I found out that wasn't true. That there was strife, that there wasn't one, I don't know if there's ever been a time when there wasn't strife in the body of Christ. And yet God still worked. Paul had a strife with Barnabas over John Mark. And right after that, God wrought special miracles by, his hand, by the hands of Paul. So that proves there can be strife. Now, there are situations, and I'm not, trying to, I'm not telling you it's okay to be in strife. No, of course it's not. But the lie of the devil is, is that if you get into any degree of strife, that you are totally ineffective. That's not true. You're only as ineffective as you let that thing make you. And so what I learned was that I found out that truth is truth. That it says that if I'm a believer, and I'm a believer whether I'm in strife or whether I'm not. Now, I shouldn't live in strife, obviously, but I'm still a believer. If somebody walked up while I was arguing with somebody and said, are you a Christian? I probably said, well, I'm not acting like one, but I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he has risen from the dead. So in that sense, yes. But at the same time, if they said that, see, I'm still a believer even though I'm in strife, Right? And the truth is, believers shall lay hands on the sick. Right? He didn't give any qualifications about it. He didn't say believers will lay hands on the sick unless they've just been in an argument or have strife in their life. Didn't say that. He made it very clear. Now, should we live with strife or sin in our life? Of course not. But God doesn't have any perfect people to work through. But yet the church, for the most part, keeps trying to tell us we've got to be perfect before God can use us. And that is a lie of the enemy. Matter of fact, it's another principle we're going to look at a little bit later on. Because if the devil can get you to believe wrong doctrine from the beginning, then the whole premise is wrong, and he can walk off and leave you alone, and you'll believe other wrong doctrine, and pretty soon you're deceiving your own self. Just like it says about being a hearer of the word and not a doer. And he doesn't even have to be around. He can just get you started and walk off. He doesn't have to do anything with you at all. And that whole time, you are... You know you're a believer, you know you love God, and you know when you get into an argument or you get into some, kind of, some type of situation that you know that isn't pleasing to God, then right then is whenever the enemy tries to set you up to pray for somebody. You say, the enemy will set you up? Yeah, because he tries to enforce the fact that you're not ready and can't do it. And he'll bring somebody, he will cause somebody to walk across your path that needs prayer. And yet you won't feel like you're ready because, man, I just messed up and... Man, I got to go fast and pray to get right again and all that kind of stuff. And I found out early on that I could make a decision that I was going to obey the Word of God no matter what spiritual condition I was in. And I started doing that, and then the spiritual condition started getting better. And I found out because truth is truth. Why, why be disobedient? You get in an argument. You're disobedient. You're fighting. You're arguing. Whatever. I'm just using that as an example. Well, you're disobedient, right? Well, why be disobedient twice? He said lay hands on the sick. If you don't, you're being disobedient again. That's something you can do no matter what. Do it anyway. At least you're not being disobedient twice, right? And believe that God will lay, that if you lay hands on the sick, that God will raise them up. And then, now, again, you might want to take a second and just fix it. You know, it just takes that long to get right, right? It doesn't take a long time. You see, many times what we do is we confuse getting right with feeling right. So you, you'll get right way before you ever feel right, right? All right. Okay, <laughs> so now, next part, real quick. <clears throat> Let's see, individually, 
His objective is your ineffectiveness for the kingdom of God. He is not nearly as interested in you as he is in your ineffectiveness, which when multiplied thousands of times over in other Christians, lowers the effectiveness of the kingdom of God and puts the enemy closer to his stated goal, temporarily, of overthrowing God. See, the, the funny thing is, for some reason, we are so generally self-centered and self-consumed that whatever's going on with us, we think it, we're the only person it's going on with. And usually you'll find out the same thing's going on with everybody else. Why? Because you're not special. And he's trying to lower the temperature of the body of Christ to the point where nobody's effective. And once you realize that, you can see it as a, you see the principle behind it, you see the strategy behind it, and then you start to wake up to the truth that this is an attack of the enemy and you don't have to abide by it. And you say, okay, whatever he's trying to get me not to do, I want to go do. Well, I, I don't know. I sure don't feel like praying for anybody. Well, that's exactly what you need to go do. You know, that's, <clears throat> there are, at some point you just need to decide that you're going to obey the Bible. I, I know that sounds really simple, but it must be harder than, you know, or it must be more complicated than most people think because most people put obeying the Bible with feeling like, you're right with God or feeling like you can do something right and that it's up to you. The idea is you can obey the Bible no matter what's going on. Okay? God can use anybody that will let him. And in the process of you being used, hopefully your life will become more in line and more conformed to the image of Christ. But you don't let people die because you messed up and kicked the cat. You do your job and you keep doing it. And you only get beat when you stop. Simple as that. Okay? Next, point two. The enemy's use of the principle of objective in corporate warfare. And we just talked about that in individual combat, but let's look at the, uh, corporate warfare. If the, enemy goal, if the enemy's goal is your effectiveness, then he must also work on the ineffectiveness of your team. Else your team members will quickly pull you from his fog. So, see, the best thing you can do, if you really want to beat the main body of the enemy... Take out his flank, right? Because then you can focus. If you can hit the weak areas and then back off, then you can hit the strong point and not worry about being flanked. So that's why the enemy, that's why most of the time when you're attacked, the same, if it's not the same exact attack, it is another attack that does the same thing and it's going on with other people in your team. With you, it may be, it's maybe Satan tries to hit you with sickness. With your team members, it may be finances. It may be anything that makes you for better, lack of a better term, psychologically off balance. Anything that can keep you from being effective. See, the idea is that, like I said just a minute ago, the enemy only has to be right one time, but we got to be right every time. And I'm telling you, that's exactly the way it is. The enemy is always trying to weaken the team. And it, all he, if he can just find something, see, he doesn't have to get you to miss a thousand miles. He just, he doesn't have to get you ice cold. If he can just get you lukewarm, he's won. Isn't that right? Because Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but not lukewarm, because then I'll spew you out of my mouth. Well, he doesn't have to get you all the way cold. He can just get you to back off, to compromise just a little bit. And if you know you're compromising, he's really got you, because now you have that little thing that he can come in and work on you with, that you compromised, rather than standing strong and doing what you're supposed to do. So, <clears throat> if the, let me go down. Let me, Satan has no new categories of attack. He will attempt the same outcome, if not by the same means, upon your teammates, which is why teammates must focus on building strength and remaining strong enough for downed fellow teammates without relying on the teammates to be there for them. Now, did you get all that? So basically what it's saying is you have to learn that your team, meaning anybody around you that's associated with you that you're close to, anybody like that, you're all going to be hit. And each one of you should have the mindset of, I will get strong enough to fight for all of my teammates and myself. Because if you can do that, if you can get strong enough to fight for yourself and your teammates, and your teammates are strong enough to fight for them and their teammates, look at how much stronger you all are. But if everybody's relying on your teammate, well, you know, I'm, not, I'm just not right, you know, not... I'm just not up to par today. You know, I'll go let the team pray for me because I know they're right up there. 
And the bad part is all the other teammates are saying the same thing. You know, I'm not really right today, but you know, maybe I can get it through their faith. And so the enemy relies on trying to keep everybody weak so that nobody can get the results. So our job, first off, should also be to become strong teammates. But before you can be a strong teammate, you've got to be a strong individual. Right? Now, the beauty of it is, no matter how strong you are, when you add that with two or three other believers, it exponentially grows. See? It gets synergistic. You get stronger. That the sum total is stronger than any of the sum total of the parts. But all together, it's stronger. Right? So that's... See, what, you know, it's funny because what I'm talking about right now is what... Most preachers try to talk about when they try to tell you, get in unity. It's almost the same thing. But the difference is, when they tell you, you've got to be in unity, what they're, well, many times what they're trying to do is cause the trouble in the church to stop. And I'm not trying to stop the trouble in the church. If you show me a church with no trouble, and I'll show you one that's not doing any good. Because the enemy's just leaving them alone, and, and they're not stirring up anything. What I'm trying to tell you is, I'm trying to get you in unity for a purpose, a mission. You have a goal. I'm not just trying to keep you from having trouble. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have tribulation in this world. But I'm here to tell you, just like what Jesus said, he overcome it, and you'll overcome it. You have to. Remember, I showed you the first part. There is a war, and you must overcome. Your eternal destiny depends on you overcoming. Right? So if you're going to overcome, then to do that, you should be a strong teammate. You should work together in unity, not so that you can have peace and so that God can work. You should come together in unity so that you can be strong enough to defeat the enemy. In other words, most people preach unity from a, let's all try to be perfect and make it so God can work. I'm telling you to get in unity so you can do your job and get this job finished so we can get out of here. Get it done. Get it finished. Get it over with. Defeat the enemy. It's fun to fight when you know you're going to win. Right? It's a, always a good fight. It says fight the good fight of faith, and the only good fight is the one you know you're going to win. There's no other type of fight, okay, that's good. So, next, where are we at? Yeah, each team, teammate must take the objective seriously enough to continue any attack, even if they are the last on their team left. You get that? No matter what happens, I don't care if everybody else quits, I don't care if everybody gets sick, I don't care what goes on, I don't care if everybody else backs off, I don't care if everybody else has other things to do, you keep going. You don't stop. Now, if you were in the last training session, we did the last SWAT team training, then you know that that's one of the attributes of a warrior, that you never give up. You never admit defeat. You never surrender, never back off. You keep on going. Now, <clears throat> the enemy's short-term objective may, to, may be to keep Christians divided over non-issues. So that they can, he can keep them from being effective in major issues. He'll get you arguing over the carpet, where to put the piano, all you know, crazy things like that. So that whenever a major issue comes up, well, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I got to go pray for that person, and, and they're going to go too. Well, I don't want to go if they're going to go. You see, you're, you're letting a minor issue dictate the outcome of a major issue. Well, what is that? Why? See, now you know why the devil wants you to argue over the piano. He don't care where the piano is. All he's trying to do is make sure that you're not in unity and not in any type of harmony with your team so that you won't go with them so that, we're, so that if any two agree is touching anything, it won't be done because you can't get two agree is touching anything. So see, remember what I said? His, his move is not always his objective. He'll move in one area. What's he doing over there? Trying to weaken you. He's trying to take out your flank so that he can, whenever he faces you face on, he can take you out then easier. So, <clears throat> one of the enemy's clearest tactics here is in using the Christian's emotions or feelings to cause them to enter into fantasized speculations on the motives of the offending party. It is amazing how silly we get in the church. You come in one Sunday, you talk to somebody, you shake hands, how you doing, what's going on, everything's fine. Next Sunday, they come in, they look at you, you look at them, you nod at them like, hey, how you doing? And they just walk out on past you and don't even nod back. And the rest of the service, you don't even hear the songs, you don't hear the preaching. All you're thinking is, what I do to them? What are they mad at me? Oh, I bet it was this. 
Well, that ain't, I didn't do anything to them. They shouldn't get mad over that. And you'll sit there and argue back and forth and miss the whole service over some fantasized speculation and come to find out this person just got a call that somebody had a heart attack in their family and they wouldn't even pay any attention to you. They weren't even there mentally. Or they, they went on past and were thinking about something else or, or you know, who knows what's going on. And yet we want to look at it now. We, now we want to build it into something. And the, the longer it takes you to get to them and say, hey, have I offended you? Or is there anything going on? You know, what's, what's the deal? And you know what? Half the time they're going to look at you and go, what? No, no, you hadn't offended me. I just got this phone call and just, you know. Or maybe I stayed up too late last night. And I'm just, you know, not all here today. That kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, I, you know, I just want to make sure I didn't offend you. But if you don't go do that, the enemy will build this thing up. Next week you'll look at them. When they come in, bless God, you're, you're glaring at them now. Yeah, and ignore me, will you, you know? And they'll look at you and nod, and you're kind of like, yeah, mm -hmm, sure, faker. You know, and you got this whole thing built up in your head. And it, it, it builds a wall, and then as soon as they say, hey, did you hear so-and-so? Uh, you know, they're sick, and they need prayer. And you're like, well, I don't doubt they're sick. You are seen the way they treated me. I'm, I know, some of you know, that this sounds silly, but some of you also know this happens every day in the church. And you're saying, and then you sure don't want to be the one to go pray for them. You know, they'll ask you, would you go pray for so-and-so? I'm busy. Bless God, he didn't even nod at me. I, I, I held back, when we were going out of the parking lot, I sat and waited and let him go first. You know, whenever he went past me, he didn't even give me a thank you wave. Bless God, can you believe that? <laughs> See, and, that, and that's exact. It's amazing that's the way Christians are. It's the way everybody is, but we should be different. Next. A Christian's immaturity can be judged by how long they dwell upon perceived offenses. There you go. I said it before. You come to me, complain about somebody, tell me how bad they treated you, and all I hear is wah, 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 and all you're saying is I'm not dead yet. That's what you're saying. I'm not dead yet. And you want to cry and whine about it? And I'm telling you, Christians have got to get their feelings off their sleeves. We've got to get busy. We've got a job to do. And maybe sometimes we ought to just look at some of those things and say, you know what, they're just toughening me up. I mean, if you're going to get mad because somebody doesn't wave back at you or smile at you, what are you going to do when they start spitting on you and throwing dead cats at you? They say, throwing dead cats? Where'd that come from? I told you, I've been reading William Booth. And they did that in the early days. That's what he said. He wrote one time in his diary and said, today we had three rotten tomatoes and four, you know, 14 eggs thrown at us and a piece of a dead cat. And I thought, a piece of a dead cat? I mean, where do you get a piece of a dead cat? You know, you see these guys in a, in a oh, here comes the Salvation Army and these three guys over in, a, in an alley and they got this dead cat and they're cutting him into pieces, you know, so they can go through it. It had to be somehow, right? I mean, you don't just come up with a piece of a dead cat. You know, <laughs> I'm telling you. And you think you got it so bad, Right? <laughs> William Booth, one time they said, he told him, he said, they asked him about um, all these things happening, and, and they said, I, you know, they come in crying, I got spit on, got this stuff, and he said, wear it like a badge. He said, you, can't, you, can, you can bleed and you can die, but you can't retreat. Now think about that. You can bleed and you can die, but you can't retreat. And we need this spirit back in the church. And I, I told the guys, I said, you know what, I have figured out what the problem of the church is. We're too spiritual. That's the problem in the church. We need to get a little less spiritual. And we surely need to quit trying to be so spiritual. Because nothing stinks worse than people trying to be spiritual. And we need to get back to a little more. We've got where we're, as they would say, so heavenly minded. We're no earthly good. You know, we, we're, we're, all, we're, we're ready to, you know, have visions. We're ready to have words of knowledge. We're ready to do all these things. But we're not ready to stop and help somebody that's broke down on the side of the road. Isn't that right? Yep. We, we don't want the natural stuff. We're waiting for the miraculous. And let me tell you, if God can get you to stop, it's a miracle. Because most Christians won't do it anymore. Afraid you're going to get you know, killed by some serial killer. Instead of thinking you might actually get a serial killer saved. I was telling the guys on the way up here, we, way back, I had a, um, I was working at McDonald's at one time. And I went out to take out the trash and come across these two guys hiding behind the dumpster. I was throwing the food, you know, you have to throw away the old food every so often. And they were hiding behind it, eating the food. Well, I brought them home, fed them. They stayed with us about two weeks. And 
man, help babysit my kids and live there and we talked to them. I mean, you know, they seemed like pretty decent fellows, really. And they were listening and we was witnessing to them and all this stuff, told them testimonies and everything. And then we, they left one, one day, we woke up and they were gone, actually. And they were left a note, said, thank you for everything. I mean, just real nice guys, you know. And we saw them about a week or two weeks later on the TV where they were, a sheriff's deputy was bringing them out of a, a, a mobile home, way out, abandoned mobile home, handcuffed in chains. And it said, the uh, two ax murderers have been caught. Oh my goodness. And my, I was showing it to my wife. I said, that's those guys. <laughs> you know, and she goes, you let two ax murderers live with us? <laughs> they babysat our kids, you know. Like, well, they heard the gospel. You know, we're all alive, okay? <laughs> so, we were protected. That's it. So, God is good. Amen? So, we've done some wild things. <laughs> we're still here. So, next part, I've got to send you to break, too. This is going real quick. I think this is... Okay, we'll do one more page. This is it. The Christian's use of the principle of, of objective. The Christian's use of the principle of objective in individual combat. The Christian should apply all of his powers of force toward the successful attainment of the objective. Whatever you aim at, go after it. Find one thing and go after it. This will include thought, activity, finances, and especially prayer. Many Christians complain that they cannot pray for long times because they run out of things to pray about. Christians can find the passion and fervency to pray for what touches their heart most. The problem is that most Christians have lost their first love and their love has waxed cold. So if you can't pray for very long, it's because there's not many things touching your heart, which means your heart has grown cold. Well, that's a primary indicator of revival, or at least of the need of revival. As I, well, that's the next thing I say right here. This is the prime indicator of the need of revival among professing Christians. You'd actually think I wrote this, wouldn't you? You would look like it, wouldn't you? <laughs> Point two, the Christian's use of the principle of objective in corporate war, war, warfare. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll get it out there. Attendance at scheduled prayer meetings are an indicator of the spiritual temperature of a church, not the Sunday morning service. Okay? You really want to know the temperature of a church? Go in, check out their, their prayer service. Don't go to the Sunday morning. That's when everybody comes out to be seen in their pretty clothes, and that's the, the social gathering, Right? Go to the prayer meeting. That's when you see who's real. Simple as that. You know, I am blessed. Our church is small back down in Texas. But I went down there one night, and we have prayer meeting every Friday night at 730. And it was amazing because we had, what, we had 11 men and two women at the prayer service. All right? And I, I noticed that, and I thought, whenever you, in which I told everybody, I said, well, I'm not going to tell people how many but I'm just going to tell everybody, we had over 50% of our church at the prayer service. It was only 13 people, but we had over 50%. See, when you're small, you use statistics. When you get big, you use numbers. Okay? That way it'll work for you. Okay? That's, note that, Danny. Make that, make that in there. So, so but it's, I'm telling you, you know your congregation is healthy when the men show up for prayer meeting. Amen? All right. Now, you know, that used to be the thing, too. You go around, you notice it was mostly women at most of the, of the services you go to. And you look around in here, and it's pretty much 50-50 from what I can tell. Pretty close. That's, that's a good sign. And I guarantee you, probably, if I took a poll, probably a good, at least 30% of the men in here have been in the military. You know? And, which is another good thing. I've always said I wanted to start a church near a military post because I guarantee you it would fill up because they understand it. So, all right. <clears throat> Next. The objective should be birthed in prayer and bathed in prayer. This does not mean a lot of discussion about how the objective will be obtained. Real prayer, not talking about prayer. That decision will be the responsibility of the commanding officer of the operation. Now I'm using military terms, and you're going to see a little bit later on in the unity of command, you're going to see the reason for that. There should, however, be significant prayer in the spirit and commands of victory. I'm talking about one particular objective, an outreach, uh, a, a certain service, a certain series of meetings, that kind of thing. This is often difficult in a typical church body, especially a large church body. There should typically be no more than two meetings concerning an operation, with the third being the launching of the operation, or at least prayer for it. Because otherwise you end up getting in 
too much talking and you end up coming with too many differing ideas and pretty soon you're more scattered than you are focused. So you want to keep it, keep it concise. <clears throat> there will be those who find their place in, a, in the intercessory area of operations. If they are truly effective there, if they are truly effective there, they will be easily spotted. You'll be able to spot them pretty easy. It's not hard to find who is really motivated in prayer. The vast majority, talking about individual people of a body, should be more involved in the actual operations. Now, here's something to watch for. Intercession must not become the excuse to avoid the work. In other words, you shouldn't you should never have more people in the prayer meeting than you do on the street doing the thing you're praying about. And most of the time, if you're in there praying about it, you ought to also be out there on the street doing it. Just as if you birth a child, you should raise it. Same thing, right? So don't use, but a lot of times we want the security of praying in here and saying we're doing our bit because we don't want to face people on the street. We can't do that, right? We have to die. Simple as that. Next, the principal objective of a Christian must be the glory of God. A Christian must make the glory of God their chief aim and effort. A Christian must accept and effect any changes necessitated by new light from the Bible. As you learn it, do it. Don't wait. Do it as you learn it, right then. All right? And you must make your objective the glory of God. You should live for that end so that everything you're doing brings glory to God. And if what you're doing can't bring glory to God, stop doing it and do something else. All right? Take a break.